All right. Well, hi, and uh, welcome back to Orange Country. Hi, Gina. Hi, Shane. We're um, trying something a little new today as we uh, sort of figure out, you know, how to keep the episodes coming when we're not always able to be in the same city. And so we are doing our first episode. It's not even via Zoom. It's via like five other things. We have... Zoom set up and a phone camera set up and this little soundboard. I mean, I feel like an engineer now. Oh, I definitely have a degree. Yeah. I've, I'm ready to produce other shows. I mean. Talk about what we're talking about first. Yeah. Let's talk about what we're going to talk about. It's like unconventional parenting, right? Because between you telling, because I'm really curious about that, how, like what you had to do to get the twins and that whole thing, if you're comfortable talking about that. And then between that and then my co-parenting situation. I feel yeah. like they're two. I like the idea of you talking about how we got the kids and that journey. That's cool. You know, you guys have an unconventional way of doing things now that you're combining families and. Yeah. Welcome to Orange Country. <laughs> The truth is you guys are the real life Brady Bunch. We are. We are the real life Brady Bunch. It is. It's it's funny to me because we both, I would say, have unconventional parenting situations, but like also it's so normal in this modern time. Like Mm -hmm. we don't have situations that are not common, but I feel like people still regard them as non-traditional. I guess that's true. I mean, I think it's just because you're in a situation where people are looking for anything to judge you over. That's probably true. Because I don't think of it as, I actually love when I, when I'm talking to people about your situation, people who don't watch the show and just know that we're friends and doing this. um, Mm -hmm. I love saying, I mean, her and her fiance, is it fiance? No. Her and her boyfriend, her Mm -hmm. and her lover. They love both, her. They yes. both love her. They both have uh, three children and they came together and it, I want you guys to do a Christmas card with the six blocks like Brady Bunch. That's what oh my, my dream God. is. That's such a good idea. You have to, you have to. And y'all will all like be looking up at each other. You know how they do like look all around in the squares. So I'm definitely going to do that now. My thought process for the last couple of years, which I haven't been able to do because of probably the fact that I have six kids, so I can never do anything. Um, is for I'm a big Halloween girl, and so I want it to be dead Brady Bunch. Uh, oh, my next level, yeah. Um, I love that for Halloween, yeah. I love that. For Y'all us. could do that like, for so many in the staircase, you know. Oh, yeah. That's, Have you ever, you know, that I went into that house? So that's so cool. Did you, right? Because wasn't it, didn't they sell it? Well, HGTV did a, I think it was HGTV, they did a a uh, remake of it. So it was the real house that they used for the exterior shots on the show, but they went inside and made it exactly the same on the inside. And um, I had a friend that worked there and let me go through it. That was one of the coolest experiences. And now I I think they did sell it. I don't know. uh, But that, that, uh, yeah, I I loved the Brady Bunch growing up. Hell, if it's on, I'll still watch it. I mean, there's something very safe about that. Um, And um, yeah, so maybe you and your kids can be on that staircase and I could be in it. I mean, I do you remember the maid, Alice? You could be Alice. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I could step right into that role. I need a little curly wig. So I think we before had talked about, there's a lot of curiosity of a lot of times when people uh, when I meet people, they want to know how Michael and I started our family. Yeah, for sure. And, That's uh, very interesting. I want to know. So we have 10-year-old twins, a boy and a girl, Dash and Dylan. And um, when Michael and I met, we were 33, both of us. And neither of us were in a position to even think about having children. I was I had, I was working as a, uh, a server at a restaurant. Uh, I had lost 
my house in Los Angeles. I had moved to LA for a short time and it was right during the crash of 2008 that I had I bought a place and then the market went to shit and I, my place went into foreclosure. I lost my car. This is when I met Michael. So certainly I wasn't saying you want to start a family. Um, so one of the things we did discuss early on was, um, that we did both see ourselves as parents. That was a pretty early conversation. I always wanted to be a dad. Um, how did you meet? We actually met at, a in Palm Springs, Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> we were, um, which is very cool. Later, our kids end up, you know, spoiler alert, but that's where our kids were born. But um, we we met in Palm Springs at a party, like a summer par- gay gathering. And, um, oh, I forgot to take my husband and I were gay. And oh, so, yeah. It checks out. Right. Yeah. It tracks. So we... We're, he was with a group from Atlanta. I was with a group from LA because I was living in LA then. And um, yeah, it was very, even though we were in our thirties, my memory of it, we were teenagers because it was very like, oh, there's a boy from Atlanta who likes you. <laughs> and so uh, I do think in the gay culture, because especially people my age, it took us so long to come out and so long to sort of... Uh, realized that there was a a path and a life for us that, you know, where we could have normal relationships and, and families and whatever normal means. I think that some of us were stunted as far as, you know, we were in our thirties, but we were, it was like we were teenagers because we spent, we spent our teen years pretending to be straight. And so there was this, this innocent sort of childlike, uh, our teenage thing too. It was like, Oh, this boy likes you. And the very, the, the next morning we were talking about, I mean, it was quick. I, I, we were just talking about what we wanted out of a relationship. Is this something that was worth pursuing? We were both going to go back to, he was going back to Atlanta. I was going back to Los Angeles. I just remember the conversation of being parents came up very, very soon. And um, yeah, it, it is, it's kind of nuts. I mean, I think in a straight relationship that, that, that would have sent somebody running for the hills. I still yeah, usually it's the guy. Yeah. So for two guys to be all in on the kid thing, that's pretty unique. And I think we had no idea how to do it. There is a really this is a long story, but but it is it is that path of law of attraction allowing that we always talk about. Uh five years later or, or four years later, Michael and I were on a cruise. And it was, uh, it was this small cruise line and, and I had just had a hit and we decided we were going to celebrate. It was my first number one. And we went on this cruise. We've been together for four years and we had talked about the parenting thing back and forth and, and through the years, but never gotten serious about it. And we were flying to Barcelona, which is where we were going to get on the plane. I mean, sorry, on, on the boat. So we're flying to Barcelona and we said, you know what, when we get back from this trip, We're going to start the process. We're going to figure it out. We live in Tennessee. We didn't know anyone who had done it. We didn't know if we wanted to adopt. We didn't know if we wanted surrogacy. We didn't know the legal parts of it, it, what the rules were in Tennessee, but we just had to find someone that could help us. And you were married at this point? We were not married. Um, No, but we were, we were engaged and we were going to get married the following, the following year. So, uh, could you legally get married? We did. We time. couldn't legally get married when we, we got married in 2012. It was not yet legal, but we had okay. like, uh, you know, we had a wedding in Mexico and all of our friends and family were there and we got, uh, legally married five years later Okay, and the kids were actually there for that. But, Aww. um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So we, we get on this boat and <laughs> Michael's last name is bomb. And so all of our stuff is under the name bomb. We end up switching packets by accident. You know, they give you like a welcome packet with all of your information in it. We okay. had the packet of a different family with the last name bomb. Okay. Oh my gosh. That's wild. Well, it gets especially wild when you hear how these people were sort of invited into our, you know, orbit and, and us theirs, but we figured out that we were going to need to get with these people and trade packets. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up, it was a, an older couple, uh, and they were from California and, and they had done this cruise before, very sweet people. 
and we sat and, and we joked that they were our long lost cousins and we traded packets. We talked for like two hours and mostly we talked about the music business because like I said, I had just had my first number one and, and people are always interested in like, Oh, you write country music. That's strange. You know, it's a, it's just a great, uh, icebreaker after talking about myself for two hours, which I could have easily gone for five or six. I, um, stopped and said, Obviously. I said, what to David Baum, uh, the other uh, guy I said, so what do you do? And he goes, I am actually the, um, the president of the adoption and surrogacy league of California. <laughs> oh my God. No way. Wait, what? Yeah. That's wild. It took our breath away because the conversation, that is, isn't it? We had had the conversation seven hours earlier about we're going to put this in motion. And then this person with the same last name as us, whose packet got mixed up here, we are sending in front of him the answer to our request, basically, because what he did was what his actual job was. It, we couldn't have designed better meeting him. He was an attorney who, what he did was go through the process with people of what your best option would be. And so that's ultimately what we did with him. That was in October of 2011 okay. when we met him and our children were born in December of 2012. So 14 months, we actually had the babies. And mm -hmm. what we decided was the best uh, course for us. We were living in Tennessee where it was not, everything was not as easy and so yeah. what we did was we, we ended up doing a surrogacy in California. Ultimately, our kids were born in Palm Springs via surrogate. Um, we had a separate egg donor. So the surrogate is not the biological mother of our children. If and that, why does that make did, sense? Why did you? Do, yeah, but why? Well, it's one of those things where it's different people do it different ways. But the, the, what we were told that if, if you can do it this way, and you don't have a family member who's going to be doing this for you or a close friend, uh, that it creates sort of a sense of the, the surrogate ha is, has no biological ties to the child. Attachment more less likely than for the mom to say, oh, I can't separate That's from right. this. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Emotionally also for the surrogate, yeah. it's probably way better which it seems more, yeah, just less emotional, right? Is probably better because I can see how that could become. And that's scary for someone who is waiting for their child that's to right. be born. That's right. Yeah. To not know. And it's scary, you know, like you said, for the surrogate too. Uh, so that just sort of eliminated a lot of possibilities that we were, since we were able to do it this way, they said, if you can cover as many bases as possible, certainly not the only way. And mm -hmm. a lot of people would say that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, um, my mom was especially confused by this whole process because oh, really? I feel like it makes total sense. Well, my mom was confused because, um, so our surrogate was Filipino okay. and my mother had somehow had in her mind that, um, <laughs> That if, we were, that if we were going to have a Filipino child, like I, I, why wouldn't we just go, this was her quote, why wouldn't you just go to the Philippines and, and adopt, adopt a child that needs parents? Okay. Yeah. Well, I see that point, but she, so she, her, so mama just didn't understand the science behind. Well, what I was said, happening. but mom, you don't understand like we're, she's Filipino, but the, the child won't be Filipino because we have a separate egg donor. And my mom said, well, you never know. <laughs> well, but we do, but, did you know? but to this did you day, yeah. to this day, because my daughter has such beautiful skin and she tans so easily. And just, you know, my mom's like, I'm telling you, she has some Filipino in her. She's been sprinkled. In yes. She's like something Filipino. got in there and we're all better for it because look at that child. <laughs> Well, everybody knows that makes babies are the most beautiful. Huh? Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So that was, that was, you know, that was our journey of, of how they, of how they came to us. We believe wow, that they, it was. they were sent to you. Absolutely. And, and yeah. we feel like they chose us 
their little souls were out there looking for, you know, just the right journey for them. And so that's, that's how they came to us. And whether it had been through adoption or through a different surrogacy process, I just feel like these were always going to be ours. You know, your children. I have a question. Are, are they genetically your children? Are they? So what we did was for the, for the, um, male part of the science. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, we mixed our sperm. Okay. Um, and so we don't officially know. I, that's incredible. I've, you're actually, cause I, you know, I have a lot of girlfriends who have had struggles with infertility and whatnot. And this is literally the first time I've ever heard that you can do that. So, and do you do that so that you don't know, so that it, they are, right. you feel they are both of your, exactly. you are both a genetic father. I feel, it. I mean, I think it's easy when kids start to get of a, a certain age, and even when they're babies. I mean, I see so much of my husband in our son that I just can't imagine, you know, cause it's not possible for both of our genetics to be there. It yeah. one or the other got there. Well, according to your mom though. Well, that, I mean, honestly, that's what's so funny is that we are all, I'm like, my son looks exactly like my husband, especially when he was a kid. I mean, when, yeah, when my husband was a kid, but my mother and my whole family swears that he looks like me. And so yeah. I think that that's what you can kind of decide, you know, you see qualities and it's a crazy, that the whole genetic nurture, nature, what is DNA? What is history? It's a crazy how much, again, I can't imagine that that child is not biologically my husband's, but there are things that he does that I'm like, that is me. I don't, you know, now uh, with our daughter, I'll be honest with you. We both agree. We don't know where she came from. She is like, we just can't, maybe, I mean, she's just maybe. so different than all of us and, and even looks different to me. People say that, They'll say, oh, uh, you look like your daughter. I'll be like, well, that is a, I take that as a huge compliment, but I don't think I look anything like her. But um, but yeah, she's our little alien. I feel like I see I see you and Dylan though. Well, I think I I try I definitely try to um uh, influence her uh her people pleasing and you know, I'm a pageant mom for sure. So I <laughs> I think she does things that people go, Oh my god, that is your child. Um, yeah. because she is, you know, sort of a, a showman. But um, but as far as actual looks, uh, you know, I feel like she she got some she's she's blessed in that regard. And I know we all think our children are beautiful and they all are. But she's especially oh, beautiful. Not all of them. That's just <laughs> cute. It's great. Well, in our eyes. Yeah. Well, ours are, but not all of the children. Yeah, absolutely. You know who um, Dylan reminds me of? Um, Annabelle, Emily's uh, daughter. I see that. Yeah, I do see that. Yeah. And even in their personalities. Annabelle is a go getter, just bit buyer. And it doesn't yeah. seem like Emily has fostered that the way that, like, I have with. Dylan, like I've really pushed yeah. her to be like, yes, go out there, do a tap dance in the middle of the mall. Um, I don't think it doesn't seem, that seems like Annabelle has just come upon that. Am I wrong? It's true. Yeah. No, not at all. That's, that's like who Annabelle is. Like Emily is definitely not like a momager type. Yeah. And she's definitely not like doing anything to make her have this over the top personality. And also like Emily, although Emily is like fun and funny and everything, she doesn't, she's not naturally like over the top, like, you know, a showman like that. Right. So that is right. all Annabelle. But the, I definitely, they, they remind me, they're definitely like cut from the same cloth. I feel I like. I agree. I agree. I'm excited for them to actually be to meet. I don't know what yeah, that would even look like. Yeah, have to set up something yeah. and get together because that would be so fun. You know, when you talk about like uh, kids sort of just when you don't push them and all of a sudden this personality shows up and you're like, what the hell? That's our son because, mm -hmm. you know, our poor son <laughs> born to these two gay dads <laughs> that can, that, that, I mean, look, we know about sports. We played sports growing up because that's what you're supposed to do in the South. And, yeah. uh, but we have both, especially Michael, has has had to just sort of 
put blinders on. And I mean, there've been times when he had to coach a soccer team. And I remember him, him telling me, he goes, it's not that I don't, that I never played soccer. It's that I've never seen soccer. And it was, he was out there literally just trying to herd cats. They were smaller, but Dash yeah. is just all sports all the time. There is, he wants to talk about nothing else. He knows every stat of every basketball team for the last 40 years. He's, he asks me constantly, who do I think Kevin Durant is underrated? I don't even, I'm literally like, I, it, who are these people? And right. um, you're like, totally. Yeah. Oh, I do. I lie. And I'm like, you know, I've, I think that just depends, you know, who you talk to. And if you're talking about, free points or if you're talking about three pointers or if you're talking about rushing the goal uh and of course not great at the line he's not great at the line look a lot of people think kevin durant is underrated when it comes to the um dribbling um yeah when he but he's he he also holds his own when it comes to the um the spinning yeah, yeah, spinning yeah. around. Yeah, he's great at that. Classic so, move. Yeah, I, you honestly, know, you could show me a picture of Kevin Durant right now, and I don't know who that is. All I keep thinking is Duran Duran. You obviously don't know who it is either. I don't know anything no. about any of that. I mean, I, I used to a little bit. Like, I used to know like the Yankees when like Derek Jeter wasn't really in his prime yeah. and like Jorge Posada was on there because it's kind of like when you're in New York, you like have to know. The Yankees oh, are. totally. So, and you know, like a thing. I actually enjoy watching bas- basketball. I think the, the, especially the strangeness of this with Dash is that I played baseball as a kid. I've definitely followed football growing up in Texas. The Cowboys are, you know, life there. But basketball is of the sports the least, uh, the least I'm, you know, that I have the l- knowledge of. So, I mean, he knew he was in trouble when he was like, what do you think about Steph Curry? And I was like, Oh, I love her. Um, so he was like, I got the wrong dads. I got the wrong dad. But we do have a basketball court in our new house or not inside, but outside. And yeah. that is he, when we came to look at this house, he didn't even come in to look at his room. He was on the court and the I was court. like, Hey, you need to come in and see what the room would look like. And he's like, I'm good. So he's like, this is my room. Yeah. Um, That's amazing. Yeah, I grew up very athletic myself, but you know, I I wasn't as into watching. Um, but I really I like going to watch in person. Like I like that whole vibe because I Me just too. like the whole feeling and the whole experience of going to a sporting event. Same. But I've yet to be to a basketball game. And that was I wanted to go. And that was like one of the things that was at the top of my list, go to a Knicks game. And then COVID hit. And so I ju- it just, you know, kind of went to the bottom of the list. I and can't believe I- I've been to Knicks games and you haven't. I know. Or like a Lakers game. Yeah. Because that's yeah. so big here. I would love to go to a Lakers game. We have done but, that too. And yeah. it is so, like you said, the experience of that, that was awesome. I mean, and especially being there with someone like my kid who is so obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, we've gotten to do some pretty amazing things, but watching him be tr- just genuinely wide-eyed looking around and looking at LeBron James, just being like, oh my, I mean, this is real. And it feels, everything in there feels so crisp. It feels like your life is in HD in there. There's yeah, just, I, I, don't know, go I don't know what there. it is. I'm not going to try to interrupt us, it. but I have to pee so bad. And oh, I'm going to okay, make sure my camera is still recording. And then we're going to talk about the Brady Bunch. My camera is still recording. Um, I'm a wreck of a person. You look beautiful. Oh, you look, you really do look beautiful. I love. I literally overslept and then, which I don't ever do, but I set my alarm. I meant to set it for eight and it was nine apparently. And then I was like f- rushing to get here. So I was like sweating and hyperventilating, you know, like how to get there. And I just like, I was in San Diego yesterday with my parents and my kids and I got home late and I like peeled off my eyelashes. I was telling Morgan this. And then <laughs> when I overslept, I just went right to bed, disgusting. And then when I overslept, I just glued, glued those lashes right back on and put on this jumpsuit and came here. It looks, you look great. 
I can't you. even tell your eyelashes are have just been double glued. I mean, that's like a <laughs> did you do you <laughs> did you have makeup on when you went to sleep? Yes. And so you just <laughs> woke up and you put makeup on and put the, the eyelashes back on. Just yeah, glued them. And also, so I've been battling, you know, when you get sick. And then at the end of the sickness, then you get the like coughing thing. And then do you get like in the middle of the night, the coughing fits that then you're like, oh, I'm going to wake up Travis or whatever. And then you have to leave the room and what? And I'm like hacking up a lot. I never got sick though. I just got that. So I've been battling that. So you have to like prop yourself up when you have that or you can't sleep. So I had to, all. I thankfully I slept like. Night. I've heard someone call this. Um, well, first of all, yeah, I'm, I, I did thought I thought you I did thought I did thought your voice sounded like it had a little something going on. I was going to ask you um, because my daughter is going through this little coughing thing that we can't. She's fine, but then yeah. at night she coughs. But I've heard someone call. I heard who was it? It feels like it was somebody uh, who calls that you have to sleep pretty. If you get your makeup oh. done and then you need to get up the next day and <laughs> wear the makeup again, they say you yeah. just you sleep pretty, which is sort of like so, a corpse. Yeah. You're just like like a coffin. Yes. Yeah. So So you, I would try to do that historically on the show for the trips. Oh. I would I would have Melissa, like my makeup artist, come the day before the trip, shellac me real good. And then Emily and I both do this. We would stretch that shit out as long as we could. How long can you go? I mean, I've gone three days before. It depends on how much adventures they make us go on on the show. I would really try hard to, even if I had to like wash my face and redo my face makeup, I would try to preserve my eyes. But then not this past season, but the season prior, we went to Mexico and I woke up and my one of my eyes, because I think I just ex- it expired, you know, it was too long to leave the lash. <laughs> it would happen. And I woke up in my eye, my one eye was so swollen. Oh. It was like Heather Gay. Remember Heather Gay in that? Oh, like, yes, of course I remember. Eye? Okay, that's how I woke up one morning. And now I'm like, I cannot, I don't know what it is from that point on. I can never sleep with the lashes on or oh. I will get swollen eyes. So, and I also, you know, I'm very... I really am very good about my skin. You know, I have Cara Gala and like I I had really bad skin. So oh, okay. I try my best at home because it really makes a difference if you take care of your skin at home. So I really try every day to do the right thing, wash my face twice a day, take my makeup off. You know, it's not nothing like over the top, but I try to wash my face. I try to be clean and hygienic, which is like <laughs> I'm winning. But some nights still, you know, you can't win them all. Man. Well, I actually think that's, a, I never knew that you could do makeup in, in, at the level that you guys, ha, you know, are on camera and do all that, that you could get it done in a way that you could actually use it multiple days. That's badass. It's that so expensive. Out. That's why it's so good you can do that because having someone do your makeup, I mean, the, the I'm shocked at what makeup artists, I mean, you talk about being in the wrong business. That is some money. Now, I know, uh, which is why I set out, I've learned it myself and I do, you know, if we have something really major and also it's like, you know, a time situation too, then Melissa comes from Melissa is amazing. But honestly, what I found is other than Melissa, I like the way I do it mm. better than most people. I know my face now I practice. Like, it's not like I'm saying this, like, I just think I'm better. Like these are professional makeup artists, but I have put in the hours and the time to work on this and I do it well, which has saved me so much money. So, and also because Melissa can't always come. So the last two things I did was E! News and um, what was the thing before that? Oh, Entertainment Tonight. And I did my makeup for both of those. I saw both of those. They were awesome. You looked incredible. Thank you. And I did those. Well, not that I don't want to spend so much time on the makeup, but I am super curious about something. Mm -hmm. So... (laughs) Now that we're friends and I've noticed that we have a way of like being able to, we're, we're somewhat self-aware people. So it's very easy to go, you know, what, what were you thinking when this happened or what, you know, and I never, I, we're already to that place, but I have found the other night, one of the scenes, you were so, uh, natural Oh, I look so scary. I know what you're talking about. I looked horrifying. When I was, I was sitting 
crying with Travis. Yes. Okay. That's a case. I'll be honest. I look at that and I was like, holy shit. How did you let me even sit there? We had, I think I had five seconds to get ready for that. And I was like, I'm just going to put on some foundation. And I just put on the wrong, the wrong foundation. What does that mean when you put on the wrong foundation? What the color was wrong? So I have, so it's like, you know, liquid foundation. So I have, that's like the stuff that's supposed to match your skin tone, but I have so many different colors because I mix them all depending on my spray tan situation. And your actual tan tan or yeah. Yeah. Actual tan or whatever. And I don't spray tan my face. So I usually have to go darker to match my body when I tan. And I just picked from the counter of a million choices. And it was just that one color and I didn't mix it or blend it or anything. And that was a mistake, clearly. Well, the, then- the thing is, I that is the, that's those moments. And you've said this before. You don't have Look, it, it sucks. You're like, I didn't like the way I looked there. Also, you're crying. I mean, th- there was so oh. much more to worry about than the the way you looked. It was that was a that was a very raw scene, uh, and and I think it it actually meant more that you weren't glam. I just I was like, at least people feel bad for me. I just <laughs> well, Don't actually, me. <laughs> I do think I do think I've seen housewives in the past. I know this is not what you were doing, but I've seen housewives in the past when, when there's sort of, uh, I don't want to say storyline, but I think that's the only word I can come up with when their story is something that maybe the audience is not connecting with, or maybe the audience disagrees with. I've noticed I'll use Erica Jane as an example. Oh Lord. I, but let me just preface this by saying I'm a huge Erica Jane fan. Please don't uh-huh. come for me. Uh, Erica Jane fans. I love her. But when, when everything sort of went awry with her story, with, uh, with her husband and there were all these things not adding up, I noticed she did a lot of scenes without makeup. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was a move. A little calculated. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to show you I'm a real person because she is always to the nines you know, like perfect, like head to toe. And I thought, boy, I've never seen her so many scenes over and over where I'm seeing what she looks like without all that. And Mm -hmm. so, um, what that was a side note, but I I think being able to, to see yourself on camera in not your best light. I mean, I'm sitting here this entire interview worried because we were, there was so much going on and trying to set this up that I actually didn't get dressed. And I just keep thinking like where my camera is over there that my leg's going to look weird or am I sitting weird? I'm just not, I'm not great when I'm on camera thinking about my angles and stuff. And when you guys cannot get bogged down in that or you will come off as so phony and that has got to be so hard. hard. It's just too much. You can't, you don't have the time. I mean, I'll be honest. I am not a person who's like, oh, this is a sad thing in my life. I should look sad. I just am. You know what I mean? And so like, (laughs) it just is what it is. Like when I was going through a really hard time, I looked that way because that's just how I can't, it becomes the last priority. But I'll tell you in that scene, I look at it and I'm like, damn, no, I wish I looked cute. I don't care. I'm crying. I still wish I looked cute, you know? And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that I, that I chose that boundary because I look crazy. I look crazy. But I guess it's also like it shows like that's real life. And some, you know, most of the time I do look just, I wish I had nothing on, no makeup, you know, because that's how I look in regular real life. And and I guess like the fact is really drives home that message though, right? That Travis just he really just loves me. I was gonna I say this him. is just one more in the in the series of hair don'ts and <laughs> weight gain. And right. face paint, and I love the man paint. loves you. He really does. Boy, I took some I took some heat for that joke I made about <laughs> about the weight. Uh, you know, some people were she's beautiful anyway, uh, even when she gained all that weight. And I was oh. like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. You know what? No, no, I, I'm teasing. I, I of course, I'm teasing. I'm I know, but people, people, you know, we have a we have a rhythm. And you get you that my heart like is in the, yeah, yeah, it's, that was for you. And people right. see that and they're like, you know, it doesn't matter how much someone weighs. 
trust me, I do not, I believe, I, I agree. I just yeah. think we're, our rhythm was basically, I mean, that was, you know, look, you're, you're on a TV show where you went through something that was so, that, that you look, you have come up to a glow up and people are inspired by that because that means something good is happening inside too. And you wanted to feel better about yourself. But I just, I, that joke about, you know, I'm not going to apologize for that because clearly anybody who, if, if someone listens to this and not just to that excerpt, they know that I'm not fat shaming someone. Yeah. Um, I'm just teasing about the fact that, boy, Travis really loves you. He loves you through the thick and the thin. You really got yourself through that. I thought you were actually going to dig. I was like, I got a little sweaty. I'm not joking. Himself in here. Thank you, Gina. I felt it. I was like, I'm gonna. (laughs) Let me hand him a shovel. Can you please? Can you please start talking about your children? Oh my god, I can. (laughs) So you have kids, okay? They're beautiful. They all look the perfect size. (laughs) My kids are actually really scrawny. They're tiny. They're tiny but mighty. My kids. Um, yeah, totally. So it has been weird, but I, I actually, I love, I love where I'm at right now. It's very, it's incredible. I love hanging out with my kids. I know we've talked about this before, but they really truly are at such a wonderful age and like point of life where they're fun and independent, but they're not teenagers yet. It really is great. Um, and seeing the six kids interact with each other and the love that they have for each other and like how much of a squad they are and how much they they truly feel like so they feel they they really are brothers and sisters, you know, and they love each other and and they are, you know, when you live as a family and you raise your children as a family, who's to say that they're not, you know? Mm-hmm. And I don't care if it's genetic or not genetic or whatever, like my stepchildren are my children too, you know? And I'm not saying exclusively because, you know, I have a very good handle on this. Like my, my three kids, they have a father and they have a stepmom and they are just as much of their parents as I am. Like we are all raising these kids together and it is a group effort and I am loving it. And the fact that anyone would really resist that or not be open to that. Now, I understand if you have a situation with an ex or a step parent or something coming into the situation and they're not quality of course, I understand why you would resist that. But the reality is, if you have somebody that is coming into your children's life and they're coming from a place of love and they want to add to your children's life and they want to bring in more light and love and, you know, just any and their their experiences, like Brit coming into my kid's life, they're learning from her. They're she's teaching them like from her point of view everything she has to offer them. And it's just more value added to my kid's life. And I don't understand for the life of me why anyone would want to take that from their children. You know, it's like so wonderful for me to think that when they're with us, they have this incredible dynamic with Travis and I, and they have these three step siblings that love them. And, you know, we're all one family, but then when they go to their dad and Brit, my kids get to have that there too. And there, and it's so it was nice. was it that seamless from the beginning? I mean, was there not a moment when one of your kids comes to you and is like, really? Like we've gone from three to six? Not the kids, not the kids. Um, they were such a perfect age for it, I uh, feel like, because they were so young that they were still in that zone where you can mold it into whatever you you really wanted to be. You know, like they weren't in a position yet mentally where they understood they could even question anything, which is in my opinion why it is so important as a parent going through a divorce to separate out your bullshit that you have with your ex and mm. that relationship failing essentially and your co-parenting relationship 
It's two separate, completely different things. And if you don't source it out from the beginning, you end up damaging your kids because of that same reason. They're so easy to manipulate at that age. I actually think also what happens is a lot of people use the kids as a weapon. They don't mean to. They're mad at the ex and they are like, well, you know, they want to make sure the kids know that person was in fault. The best parenting I have seen when it comes to the splitting of families. And by the way, my mom did this really well I, it, at times. I mean, there was also times when I look back and, and my mom would say, well, I, you know, she, she didn't mean to, but she certainly had an energy about my father, but mm-hmm. for good reason. I mean, look, their, their break was not great and we could do that another time. But what she did early on was she didn't talk about him. She didn't go into it. And, and I've seen parents that really, they, you, they lean on their kids emotionally and they, their kids are the ones that end up getting the brunt of the bad of the other parent. And, yeah. when, and regardless of what your spouse did, when you put your kids in the middle of that, even if, even if temporarily and for this part of their life, even if they think, well, my mom really did everything. My dad was an asshole. Someday they're going to see that they didn't have a choice in that opinion. Right. That, w- that someone put that in their mind. They have to form their own opinions about the other parent. This is not your situation. I'm saying this is, this is something I see a lot and I wish that people would recognize that that is going to catch up with you. Your child is going to resent that you controlled the narrative. Even if your spouse is an asshole, even if what they did was awful, your kids will find out. They don't need to learn that from you. And not as a child. Right. And what I mean, I think that your job as a parent is to instill in your children a very strong foundation so that then when they get older, they have that foundation already built up and then they can handle and process things that aren't so amazing, you know, and they will be better off processing that when they're literally mentally able to do so. As children, they're just not. So even if, if the, if the dad is so awful, then I believe in, you know, just say nothing probably, but for me, it's even take it a step further. And why, why even, why not just let them have what everybody else has, which is your dad's great. You know what I mean? I don't care what happened between Matt and I, and there were bad stuff in there, but my kids why I'm never going to take that away from my children. So for me, I always wanted my kids to think that their dad is a hero. He's the best because everybody else gets to think that. And I think it's so unfair. I'm never going to take, I'm not in the business of taking from my children, you know? So I, I just would always act like he was the greatest because to them he was. And the relationship mm. between Matt and I had nothing to do with the relationship between Matt and his children. And if we're no longer together, I don't have to worry about or, you know, instill in them any emotional anything about the relationship between me and Matt. Mm. All I need to do now is foster the emotional relationship between me and my children and the emotional relationship between Matt and his children. That is... Amazing. And I've seen that. We've all seen that from you. It's, and it's, you could have done it a different way very easily. And, um, because you actually had hard facts. I mean, you actually had things that went on that were discussed on the show that you did not bring into the relationship of your children and Matt. And, and, um, I think that I hear, I hear rebuttals to this in my mind of what people that I know that do this the other way would say, well, I want my kids to know that their dad's probably not going to show up. I don't want them having expectations. I don't want them getting their heart broken. Guess what? It's going to break their heart anyway. There's no reason for you to give them the idea that this person is not going to show up for them before it happens because no amount of rehearsing that behavior 
is going to take the hurt away. All it's going to do is is make it happen twice. And and then the child is confused. And then the child is afraid to talk about the other parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just puts uh, so much pressure on kids. And um, I just have to commend you. Because you you guys have done such a great job of that. And well, also I have to say people. in my circumstance, he did not do, that was not my situation, you know? So I don't have, I never had to deal with that kind of stuff because Matt always showed up as a father. Right. So there was never any of that. I can say, I would think my instincts, I would think if that was the case, would be in line with what you're saying, which I would not be preparing my kids in advance to be let down. I think that I would personally focus more on um, once the letdown happened, now how to shift to just pull my kids back up. Yeah. Because I always want them up. And I think that I would go into this mode where it's like, okay, dad didn't show up. I honestly probably, and I'm not saying whether I know this is right or wrong because I don't, but my instincts would tell me that I would immediately go into honestly, probably trying to come up with a good excuse as to why he's not there so that my kids don't go down. Now, I don't know if that's the right thing or not, but my natural instinct is just never to let my kids stay down too long, you know? And so it's okay to feel disappointment and all that and feel all your feelings. But now how are we going to get back to where we're okay and we understand, all right, you know what, dad didn't show up, but this is what we have to deal with. This is our personal journey. And that maybe doesn't necessarily, like more acceptance, you know? I think you need to maybe work on getting them to accept things and move on. Those kind of situations are are tougher, right? My mine was easier to sort out, and I can certainly speak to. Um, I can speak. There's a lot of people who get divorced, and all of the BS and the hurt and the bad is just between it, the, the romantic and emotional relationship between the parents. And in a lot of circumstances, right. both the moms and the dads are still good parents. And so for me. That is was easier for me to sort out in my head. I think where people go wrong is they assume because they hate the other parent or the other parent hurt them so bad. Now they're combining the two totally. and they're making it so that dad was bad to me. So dad's a bad dad. And right. they're two separate things. And you cannot combine them. You cannot ma- make it about that. Matt just didn't like me. That's fine. He likes his children and I'm not going to take that from them. Yeah. And I'm not even sure if he didn't like you. I mean, it sounds well, like there I were, there were, yeah, no, no, I know, I know. You know yeah. It, but that's the, the simplicity, you're, you're keeping it black and white. You're saying yes. it has nothing to do with that. You know, I have to, I'm going to, I, I, I almost uh, hesitate to tell this story because it's one of those things like earlier where we joked that I had gotten into something where I was like, how am I going to find my way out of this? This is a really personal uh sort of look into my marriage and my life. And, and, um, had I been on a reality show, you would know all this because it is something I couldn't have avoided, uh, telling, and maybe God's telling me not to tell it because there's an airplane flying over. So, you know, I, we, we've talked a little and people that know anything about me know I've, I have my a struggle with, uh, with addiction. And, mm-hmm. um, a few years ago that during COVID, um, that really snuck up on me and in a, in a place where I was trying to be sober and to uh, live a sober life and, and, and also portray myself as a sober person, I mm-hmm. started secretly drinking and mm-hmm. taking pills. And um, I was, you know, it's just, a, it was a dark place. And um, what ended up was I had to go to rehab. And when my husband found out how many things I had been lying about, how many secrets I had been, you know, keeping, he was devastated and, um, hurt and angry and, you know, really felt like he had been betrayed and he had. And, uh, and you also start looking back at all the things as a parent, like, did you ever drive with the kids drunk? Did you take care of the kids when you were taking pills? Did you, you know, and, and honestly, I couldn't say no to those things. I couldn't recount or everything I had done. And, and, uh, 
he was so mad at me that when I first went to get help, we didn't speak for a couple of weeks. Um, and, uh, the, the one thing I just have to say, it would have been so easy for him to bring our kids into it to, and he protected me at all costs from every angle with those kids. And but he um, protected his children. That's right, Gina. Yeah. That's right. Thank you for clarifying that because that's mm -hmm. what people need to hear. Yeah. He Protection. was so mad at me and we didn't think we were going to make it. I mean, it was, there were so many lies and so many things that it was like, how do you unravel this? He is a, he's better at that than I would have been. Um, I would like to think that had I found out all of that, that I would be able to get through it. But I, I have, I love to keep a file cabinet on people and, <laughs> and go, remember when you did this? He's okay, never, Tamara. he's never done that to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so he, he, you know, when we got through it and I got, and we made a commitment that we were going to, um, we were going to keep going, you know, he's never held it over my head. He's never, it was, I did, I did the work and am still doing it. But, but I just have to say to people, I really want people to hear that because he had every right and he was the one who had to, to handle everything. He's, mm -hmm. you know, we had also just lost our nanny. And, and when I say lost, I mean, she passed away. Somebody who had been with us for seven years of our children's life from the moment they were born. So not only did she pass away and, and, and so many of the things we hadn't handled emotionally that we hadn't handled even physically, she had done so much that then we, we're, we're now given this beautiful responsibility that at that point we didn't realize how much we had missed. We step in and then he realizes he doesn't really even have a partner in this. It's just him. The resentment could have taken over mm -hmm. and he separated it and said, what you just said was so perfect. He protected them because they can draw their own conclusions about their asshole father down the road if I should decide to not do the work and show up for myself, for my marriage, and for my kids. But he didn't need to tell them that, you know? No, and yeah. now they're safe from that. And when they're older, now you guys can, now it's different. Now you get to discuss not how, how dad's an asshole and, you know, fucked up and da, 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 da. Now you guys get to, to discuss how dad, how, how one, how Michael protected them. That's right. And also protected you in that relationship with your children for you, preserved that for you, didn't take that from you even though he was so angry at you. And in addition, you get to discuss how Shane picked himself up because he loved his children and he loved his family, took responsibility and owned the mistakes and everything and all the ways that he let everybody down and got back to this incredible life that you guys wanted to mold together. And for me, that's a much better story and much more helpful and a value added to my children's mental health as they go through life. I'm way more focused on the picking back up part than the fucking up part. And for me in this equation, I have the same thing. I get my children get to focus on how mom, you know, stood up for herself, but protected us from the whole thing and how dad put in the work, took responsibility and showed up for them and also still shows up for me. Now you and Michael are still together and you were able to come back together and preserve that relationship. But Matt and I, in some way, are, we're still together. That's and right. we were able to preserve our relationship that we very much still have. It's not a romantic relationship, but it's a co-parenting relationship because we have children together and we have a responsibility to love and respect each other and to raise our children that way. And, and, and that is what I want for my kids. And what I want to acknowledge is that not everybody does have a, a partner or former partner willing to do those things. Right. But it's not up to you to create the narrative for your children of what that other person is. That will show up. They, Assholes will reveal themselves. They do. And even if you can't, this is what I really feel. Even if you need two people willing to do the work, be responsible to make this happen, like between Matt and I, between Michael and, and yourself, 
if you don't have that, which happens a lot, you still have a responsibility to parallel parent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you do the exchanges and not poison the well there as much as you can, even if the other person is poisoning the well. Mm -hmm. It is the hardest thing. And I'll be honest, I have both situations. My situation is we're both in it to win it and we're, we're crushing it. My other situation with Trav, we have to parallel parent and we have an obligation, even though it's so hard because the well on the other side is being poisoned, mm. we will not poison it. We will not. That is not that bad. right there is what people need to hear. That's such a perfect, that is such good advice because boy, it's it's so hard to not fight fire with fire and mm-hmm. no amount of um, getting to someone's level is going to change theirs. You know, it's like no amount of insulting is ever going to, uh, you're, you're never going to come back with something fast and hard enough that it somehow makes that person sane or come to your side. And I, you know, I, I don't know all the details and I don't know how much you're, you're at Liberty to speak about, but I do think people really needed to hear that because we, we're both talking about how, you know, in, in my relationship, you're, you're sort of, like Michael and I was mm-hmm. sort of like Matt and, and even though we, yeah. you know, we stayed married and you guys didn't, but as parents, it would have been very easy for you and Michael to villainize us. And, um, and honestly, the things that you could say about us are true, you know, yeah. but that would have, what you said before was so, I have to repeat it. And I don't know exactly how you said it, but that what it, how it sounded to me was that's not only making your kids feel question their their dad and feel unsafe with that person, they now feel codependent and feel like they have to support you. Right. They now feel responsible. I don't know if codependent, that, that word was probably wrong. They feel responsible for your feelings because you've said your dad isn't stepping up. Mm-hmm. So now you- they feel like, Oh, well I have to make mom feel better. Mm-hmm. And Putting that, you know, that there's just so much there. But what you're talking about, the other, when someone else is poisoning the well, I think that's what someone else would say. Well, what if I'm, you just can't. It's like, let it, let, let, do your thing separate from that. And it's so hard, honestly. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Sometimes you want to, but I won't because just like I feel obligated to protect my children, I feel obligated to protect my stepchildren. And I feel obligated to just have them, allow them to have at least one environment that is free of bullshit and safe. And they can just be kids and they can just have fun and they can just feel safe and they can feel comfortable with their feelings, even if they're good or bad or whatever it is, those are their feelings and they're allowed to have them. And, you know, I just want to foster and kind of create that environment. And then, yeah, of course you have conversations with your partner where you're like, I can't take this. This is so hard, but have those with your partner. That's where it's appropriate. Not with the kids. The kids just have to stay out of all of it. They have to. And like, can you imagine what it's like to be a child? Cause I can't, cause I come from very good parents. So I can't imagine what it's like to be a child already having to deal with having to be like, all of a sudden mom and dad aren't together anymore. They don't know what's going on. And now it's like, oh, one, one, these days you live here and then you live here and you're ping ponging back and forth. Even that is crazy to me. And you have different things and different rules and how hard is that as a kid to have to deal with that? And then on top of it, you have to be like, wait, mental check here. We hate dad. Oh wait. Okay. Here we hate mom. Okay. I'm not allowed to love mom here. Okay. I'm here. I'm not allowed to love dad here. My home, you're allowed to love whoever you want. And 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 that just is the standard of what it's going to be in my house because the thought of doing that to a kid is just horrifying to me and I will not do it. Gina, I've, I feel like there's nowhere else we could take this. That feels like the most perfect, perfect way to wrap up this conversation that I honestly had no idea where it was going to go. When a little heavy. We're talking about no. It that was necessary. It's funny because I, in doing this at all and having these conversations with you and recording them, there's a lot of times when we'll say things that I'm I'm having the other conversation of the person going, "Well, who gives you the authority?" And the truth is, 
we both do have authority in all of these subjects and our honesty around that. I guarantee you, even if it's one person, somebody's going to hear this and go, God, I'm going to, I'm going to treat this. I'm going to treat this bump in my marriage. I'm going to treat this divorce. I'm going to treat this, um, this separation differently. Yeah. And there's no, it doesn't have to be a villain. No, even if right now somebody watching this, like even, you know, they don't want to admit it out loud, but they admit to themselves, oh shit, I am, I have been doing that to my kids. You know what? It's okay. Tomorrow's a new day. Just stop. You have the ability to turn this train around. You really do. And your kids will thank you for it. Amen. Well, Shane, as always, it's been a major pleasure. I think we should sign off. We love uh, to ask all you folks at home viewing. Thank you, first of all. And please, please don't forget to like and subscribe. We really appreciate that. And uh, appreciate you listening to us. <laughs> yeah, this is great. And I love, I, I've heard from people through, you know, different social media is also just people that I've talked to and, and met since we've been doing this. And I don't, I, you know, I don't know how many people listen to this. I have no idea. It might be 10 people, but I'll tell you the people that I have talked to, it's been so nice to hear that they're, that they are engaged with it and that, you know, they're sharing in our sort of, uh, in, in our, in our own messiness and yeah, saying me too. Totally. So. And this is just, yeah, it's us having, just talking, you know, and if it resonates with people, that's great. And um, if it helps anybody, that's even better. Yeah. All right. I'm sad I can't hug you, but. I know. Whatever. that That's the weirdest feeling. Although I'm sweaty today. You probably would be like, get off of me. me. But I did get a spray tan before this. Sometimes when I spray tan and then I sweat, this, this smells not good. It's so bad. I don't let her spray my armpits. It's a weird, I don't know why the smell gets so intense. Because it's like poison. Yeah, exactly. It's that poison. Like hot, hot poison. <laughs> Doesn't smell good. It turns out. Oh, God. Oh, God.